I think we always want to affirm the reading of God's Word. Amen. Let me just summarize what you said amen to in a modern memo. Dear Abraham, kill your only son, God. It's pretty hard, isn't it, to swallow that? Well, I mean, at face value, I think that that's a difficult text for us to understand. And this week, we're going to be talking about forgiveness again. Forgiveness 102. Last week, we talked about forgiveness 101. And, and just for clarification, I want to say that last week, we emphasized forgiveness in relation to us and what God is calling us to do. We looked at the story in Matthew 18, you remember? That servant who had that great debt and he couldn't pay it, and he was called to account, and God said, hey, you're going to prison, and your whole family, and he said, give me time and I'll pay it, and the story is illustrating that God had compassion on him and forgave him the whole debt, and then he went out and he grabbed someone by the throat and he said, pay me the little pittance that you owe me. <laughs> and we, we learned that God has not only allowed us to run up a great debt, the, the debt of sin that we can never repay, but he's forgiven us for that debt. Even when we haven't asked for forgiveness, He's forgiven us. We ask for more time. And if we miss that, if we miss the fact that God has freely forgiven us by His grace, it will affect the way we relate to others. But the thing that always comes home to my heart, and I think all of us have to deal with when we talk about forgiveness, is literally how hard it is at times to forgive people. And because we struggle with that, we find it, I think, challenging to believe, as we should, that we're forgiven, or that we're under grace, or that we're Christians. Because here we are, in our minds, reading these stories, and reading these admonitions of, from God to forgive people, and, and reading about how God has forgiven us, and then we have the hardest time forgiving people. And so, this morning, what I'd like to do is, I'd like to suggest in the story of Abraham and in the context of Forgiveness 102, that forgiveness is not easy. And it was not easy for God either. Now let me just clarify that. Sometimes when we talk about forgiveness as it relates to God, we think, well, God has forgiven us. Like, there was nothing to that. You know, God's forgiven us. So we ought to forgive other people. And it should just be just as easy as it was for God to forgive us as it is for us to forgive others. The problem with that is, is that we don't always understand the struggle that God faced in manifesting forgiveness to us. And that struggle is not always demonstrated in the Bible very clearly. There aren't a lot of stories that pick up forgiveness from God's perspective. Abraham and Isaac is one of those stories. And that's why this morning I want to focus just a little bit on this story and the context of God's heart. You see, Abraham was called to illustrate, if you will, the heart of the Father. In the story of Abraham and Isaac, Isaac represents Christ, the Son, but Abraham represents the Father, and the story is all about the Father and the Father's heart and how difficult it must have been for him, and yet how willingly... He obeyed the command because Abraham was, well, Christ put it this way. Abraham saw my day. He rejoiced to see my day, and he was glad. The context of that statement in John chapter 8 and verse 56 is Jesus Christ interacting with the scribes and Pharisees and in the larger context talking about the fact that they're going to kill him. He's going to die. And in this context, Jesus refers back to the story of Abraham. He refers back to the life of Abraham. He talks about how Abraham saw his day. God gave Abraham this command to help him to understand his own heart and the struggle that he was going to go through in this day of sacrifice and the experience that he was going to illustrate. Abraham was called to sacrifice Isaac as an illustration, if you will, of the heart of God. So God's heart, love's heart, was laid bare 
before all of us. God was willingly sacrificing his son. Now, the New Testament writers like Paul and James and even John wrote powerful affirmations of this story, this call to Abraham. John, you know, penned that famous verse, that the one that is probably the most uh, popular verse, the most beloved verse in the New Testament. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Now we have a struggle when we look at Abraham's call, but in Genesis 22 verse 2, notice the parallel here. Now take thine son, thine only son Isaac, wh Isaac whom thou lovest, and offer him there. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The parallel is powerful and beautiful. Now we can hardly imagine the trial. I mean, think about it. The crushing weight of darkness that must have sequestered Abraham's every step toward Mount Moriah. He wouldn't even tell his wife. He left without letting her know because he didn't want her to bear the same weight that he was bearing in following through with this. And I want us to understand right from the get-go that, that even though God arrested Abraham's hand, stopped him from making that final sacrifice, in Abraham's mind, in his intent, in his purpose, he made the sacrifice. He made the sacrifice. So it's really important for us not to say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, you know, this is, this is embarrassing that God, Abraham didn't actually do it. No, he did actually do it. And the reason why this is important is because this story is not about child sacrifice. This story is about an illustration of the sacrifice of God the Father for us in giving His only begotten Son. So this story of love sacrifice and deliverance by faith is, I think, the most decided declaration of the Father's heart in the Old Testament. You just don't find stories like this all through the Old Testament. And I think it's important to recognize that this story is not covered up. It's not, uh, you know, a blot on God's character in the Old Testament. There are some apologetics, there are some people, even Christians, who try to explain, you know, well, Abraham was really motivated by the pagan idea of child sacrifice, and he was still, you know, being influenced by that, and so God was kind of weeding this out of him. No, no, no. God knew what he was doing in calling Abraham to make the sacrifice. He was intentionally giving us an illustration of his great sacrifice for us. And that's why the book of James says, was not Abraham, and this is James chapter 2, 21 and 23, 21, 22 and 23. James 2, 21 to 23. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by faith, excuse me, by works was faith made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled, which said, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, for he was called, here it is, he was called, anyone know? The friend of God. Abraham was called the friend of God. This whole experience that Abraham went through brought him to the place where he was called the friend of God. That is a unique and powerful statement of Abraham's relationship with God affirmed in the New Testament book of James. Why was he called a friend of God? Because friends share a special relationship. Abraham shared a special relationship with God. Unique, if you will. Unique, if you will, in the Old Testament because Abraham illustrated the heart of the Father as none other story of the Old Testament and even the New Testament does. Now, Paul places this story in the Hebrews Hall of Faith chapter. In Hebrews chapter 11, verses 17 through 19, Paul says, By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it is said, that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. In other words, I, Abraham was thinking, you know what? This is a miracle child. There's no way that I could even have this child in and of myself. My, my wife, uh, Sarah, can't have children. And I'm so old, he was 99 at the time, there's no way I can have children anymore, so this is a miracle child. This child was born of a miracle, and if God actually wants me to sacrifice this child, he can raise this child up again, because this child came forth from him by a miracle anyway. 
It was, it was brought forth. Isaac came forth from the dead originally because he came forth from the deadness of Sarah's womb. That's basically what Abraham is thinking in his mind. Now, if that weren't enough, James actually says that Abraham was justified by works when he offered up Isaac upon the altar. And, and I have to ask the question, he was, you know, justified by, by child sacrificing works? Really? There's no way this story is about child sacrifice. This story is affirmed in the New Testament because it directly points to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and the Father's heart. And that's why it's connected with justification by faith. Because Abraham's whole premise was by faith he was going to trust that God was going to do something special here. Something that he couldn't do in and of himself. Something he couldn't accomplish. God had already done something special in his life. And God was going to continue to do something special in this particular situation. Now, I want to pause there for just a second. We're talking about forgiveness. And when we talk about forgiveness, we're stepping into a realm of impossibility when it comes to us as fallen human beings. We just don't forgive and we don't, even when we do it, we don't do it well. And that's why this story is so significant. Because this story is calling us to put our faith, our trust, our weight in God for forgiveness. That he can do for us and in us those things that we cannot do ourselves. Now there are people that need our forgiveness. Whenever we talk about forgiveness, those people come up into our minds, don't they? Whoever they are, wherever they are, we're thinking about them right now. <laughs> and, and some of us are thinking, that would be impossible. And that's the point. God wants us to step into the shoes of Abraham. He wants us to understand how impossible it all looks, and yet how all things are possible with God. But he also wants us to recognize that he can relate. Forgiveness isn't easy, but it is the ultimate revelation of the Father's heart. So, Central to the issue of Abraham's faith is the question, would it endure this test to trust God when he had previously failed to trust God? Now, over and over again, Abraham had failed to trust God. We know that, don't we? Uh, there was a time when he was told he was going to have a child, and, you know, a year goes by, nine months go by, and, you know, there's no child, so what does he do? Sarah says, hey, get together with Hagar. He follows Sarah's advice. Do they produce the child of promise? No. Then there were times, you know, when he was traveling, he was uh, under uh, the, uh, Abimelech in his territory in the, uh, at another time within, in Egypt, and he thought in his mind, mm, my wife Sarah is so beautiful. This is the kind of thoughts I have all the time. My wife Sarah is so beautiful. Man, I'm going to have to make sure um, i got to do something. Uh, Sarah. Tell the Egyptians, tell Abimelech that you are my sister. Now, that was kind of a half lie, wasn't it? I mean, you know, there was some truth to that, but then again. But, but Abraham, in this case, was showing a lack of trust in God. His faith was faltering. And God rebuked him for that. God rebuked him for getting together with Hagar. And God rebuked him for not trusting him in this time of test and trial. And so now the test increases. And I want to tell you this. Please listen carefully. Let God empower you by his grace to be faithful in the little tests. Because when you fail those little tests, the tests only get more intense. They get greater and greater and greater. Not because God wants to bring greater tests to you, but because your lack of building faith and strength makes the next test harder. The stronger you get, the easier the tests are. It doesn't matter how hard the test is. You know, we're going to be facing a final test that's coming upon the whole world to, to try all those that dwell upon the earth. And that test is going to be easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Seriously. If we allow God to develop in us faith and strength right now in the little tests, but it's going to be almost overwhelming for us if we don't allow God to develop our character right now. And that's the point. That's the point. 
God wants to develop our character now. And so Abraham is going through this, and it's almost an overwhelming test for him. I want to read you a commentary on this from E.G. White, Patriarchs and Prophets 154. This is what it says, describing this, this experience. The sacrifice required of Abraham was not alone for his own good, nor solely for the benefit of succeeding generations, but it was also for the instruction of sinless intelligences of heaven and other worlds. The field of the controversy between Christ and Satan, the field on which the plan of redemption is wrought out, is the lesson book of the entire universe. Because Abraham had shown lack of faith in God's promises, Satan had accused him before the angels and before God of having failed to comply with the conditions of the covenant. And, as unworthy of its blessings, God desired to prove the loyalty of his servant before all of heaven to demonstrate that nothing less than perfect obedience can be accepted and to open more fully before them the plan of salvation. Now I want you to focus on that last line. To open more fully before them the plan of salvation. So Abraham is being tested, but he's also been given an opportunity to open more, more fully before the unfallen universe, before you and I, the plan of salvation. And what is that plan of salvation all about? Well, it's all about God forgiving us through Jesus Christ. Was it easy? Sometimes we don't even go there. We don't even think about it. We don't even ask the question, was it easy for God to forgive us? We just think, well, God forgave us. That's just the end of the story. The story of Abraham tells us of the struggle in the Father's heart. There's no way we can read the story of Abraham and think, oh yeah, Abraham, yep, that was just a pagan thing, and Abraham was into pagan things, so Abraham just, you know, saddled up the donkey, got the wood and said, follow me, Isaac. Where are we going? I'll tell you when we get there. Da -da 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 -da. Here we are. <laughs> Don't do it? Are you sure? Because I'm willing to do it. I mean, this is like, you know, no problem for me. No way. This was a struggle for Abraham. It was difficult for him. He could hardly even bear the idea. And Abraham is illustrating to us the heart of God. God is looking at us and he's saying, I want to forgive them. And then he's looking at his son and he's saying, but in order to do that, the sacrifice has to be made. He's wrestling with this. To open up more fully before them the plan of salvation. You know, there's no story in the Bible that has such a huge pile of evidence connecting it to the plan of salvation. Um, I want you to look at some biblical parallels. If you have a pen and, and paper, you can write some of these down because you're, you're really going to want to go back and study these. These are really amazing. These are amazing parallels between the Abrahamic story and Calvary. Number one, parallel number one. It was a three-day journey. It was a three-day journey. And you can imagine how Abraham felt on that three-day journey to Moriah, you know, because, you know, if you're going to give up your son, you, you, you love him and you're attached to him, and yet at the same time, though, the more you feel attached, the harder it is to do it. So for three days, Abraham is, in a sense, agonizing over the separation from his son, this, this experience that he's going through. For three days, he agonizes over his only son. Now, that parallels the three days that God's heart must have agonized over the separation that he had with his son. Matthew 12, verse 40 is a good reference for that. Number two, Abraham trusted, and there's, there's about 13 of these that I'm going to give you. Number two, Abraham trusted that Isaac would be raised from the dead. That's what he trusted. But we read that in Hebrews 11, remember? He said, I believe in that... Well, that's exactly the same as what God promised Jesus. The third day I'm going to raise from that. This commandment I've received of my Father. And that's John chapter 10 and verse 18. Number three. Isaac's birth was a miracle. Who else's birth was a miracle? Christ's birth was a miracle. He's born of a virgin by the Holy Spirit. Miracle. Number four, Abraham led Isaac to Mount Moriah. He led him to the wood and, and to the altar. And Isaac didn't know what was going on. Abraham led him step by step by step by step. In other words, here's the father leading his son. Isaac says, well, where's the offering? <laughs> and Abraham, you can just, God will provide an offering. By faith, he says that. 
And in the same way, think about this, think about it, God led His Son to the temple, to Calvary, all through His life. God led His Son, step by step by step. God is in heaven and He's leading His Son to die, to be separated. Number five, the geographical location. I don't know if you're aware of this, but the place where Abraham offered Isaac is the Temple Mount. Today there's a mosque on that Temple Mount and you can go in there and get a tour of that mosque and they actually have a place where they open it up where you can put your hand in to this hole and this, you can touch the rock where Abraham offered his son. Now it, Muslims claim that that was Ishmael that was offered there. But it's on the Temple Mount. And it was just in that same location, just a few hundred yards away, that Jesus was offered up on Calvary's Hill. So the geographical location was the same. Number six, the child Isaac was instructed by his father eventually that he was going to be the sacrifice, just like the child Jesus was instructed by his father that he was going to be the sacrifice. Luke 2, verse 49. When Jesus was 12 years old, he went into the temple and he saw everything that was outlined there in the sacrificial system and he realized, can you imagine as a young man, it says the Bible says he grew in wisdom and stature with God, he realized that lamb is me. That represents me. I'm the lamb. And of course later on John the Baptist said as much in John chapter 1 and verse 29. Number seven, Isaac carried the wood to Moriah's place of sacrifice just like Jesus carried his wooden cross to Calvary's place of sacrifice. John 19, verse 17. Number eight. Both Isaac and Jesus willingly submitted to the sacrifice of themselves out of love. You know, Isaac was a young man. Abraham was old. Abraham, we know, was over 100 years old. Isaac could have fought with him. Isaac could have resisted. Isaac could have said, no way, Dad, I'm not doing this. I'm not going to do this. I mean, that's how most of our young people are today, right? It's like, could you please, how much will you pay me? Isaac submitted. Christ submitted. You can read about that in Matthew 26, verse 42. God and Christ said, I don't want to do this, I don't want to do this, I don't want to do this, but not my will, but thy will be done. Do you think Isaac wanted to be sacrificed? I don't think so. But he was willingly submissive to the call. Number nine, both Isaac and Jesus were bound. In Matthew 27, verse 2, it talks about how Jesus was bound. We know also from this story that Isaac was bound. And number t uh, 10, Abraham raised up his knife against his son, and God raised up a sword against his son, according to Zechariah 13, 7. Awake, O sword, against thy shepherd. And the one... Number 11, like God who spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, Abraham offered up his only son. Romans 8, 32. Number 12. Abraham and Isaac, like God and the Father, went together to make the sacrifice. Yet it was a heart-wrenching experience for both of them. They were in it together. Over and over again in the story in Genesis 2, it says, together they went, together they went, together they went. Jesus questioned over and over again. He says, my, 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 me and my Father are one. We're together in this. God and the Father, Jesus and the Father were together as Abraham and Isaac were together. And the last one, number 13, both Isaac and Jesus were delivered from death on the third day. Now there may be more. Those are just the ones that I picked up as I, as I started to, to dig into this story. And by the way, this story has been so filled with controversy about people, naysayers, people who are against the Bible, who say, oh, how could you worship a God that would call someone to sacrifice their own son, that I think we've kind of been apologetic and, and tried to say, well, it wasn't really all about that, and we've kind of, you know, punt, laid it aside. And I don't know that we've really dug into the story and recognized the richness that is here. So I want you to take these parallels, I want you to take these scriptures, I want you to go back and really study this out. Because I think there's some beauty here that perhaps we haven't seen. This story, I think, unfolds this beautiful parallel to God's heart in the sacrifice of His only Son. Now, I want to read to you 
uh, from Patriarchs and Prophets, E.G. White, Patriarchs and Prophets 154, again, some more commentary on this because I think it's really important. It says, to impress Abraham's mind with the reality of the gospel, as well as to test his faith, God commanded him to slay his son. The agony which he endured during the dark days of the fearful trial was permitted, the agony that Abraham endured was permitted, that he might understand from his own experience something of the greatness of the sacrifice made by the infinite God for man's redemption. No other test could have caused Abraham such torture of soul as did the offering of his son. Stop there for just a second. What was Abraham going through? Was this easy peasy, lemon squeezy to him? No, his soul was being tortured, tortured. What was the illustration? Next sentence. God gave his son to death and agony and shame. The angels who witnessed the humiliation and soul anguish of the Son of God were not permitted to interpose, as was in the case of Isaac. There was no voice to cry, it is enough. To save the fallen race, the King of glory yielded up his life. What stronger proof can be given of the infinite compassion and love of God? He that spared not his son, his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him freely give us all things? Now I know, God said to Abraham, now I know that you love me, that you have faith in me. Well, turn the story around. Now we know that God loves us. Now we know, we know beyond a shadow of a doubt. So the story of Abraham's sacrifice, I think, illuminates God's heart struggle. Let me share with you another commentary. This one is from McLaren's commentary, Expositions of Holy Scripture on Genesis 22. McLaren says this, Lastly, Abraham was rewarded by being made a faint foreshadowing for all time of yet the more wondrous and awful love of the Divine Father, who for our sakes has surrendered his only begotten Son, whom he loved. Paul quotes the very words of this chapter when he says, He that spared not his own Son, but delivered him up for us all. Such thoughts carry us into dim regions in which perhaps silence is best. Did some shadow of loss and pain pass over the divine all-sufficiency and joy when he sent, sent his son? Was the unresisting innocence of the son a far-off likeness of the willing eagerness of the sinless Savior who chose to die? Was the resolved surrender of the Father a faint prelude of the deep divine love which gave his only son for us? Shall we not say... Now I know that thou lovest me because thou hast not withheld thine son, thine only son, from me. Shall we not recognize this as the crown of Abraham's reward? This act of surrender of his dearest to God, his friend, has been glorified by being made the mirror of God's unspeakable gift, the gift of his son to us, his enemies. Abraham is called a friend of God because he is showing us, he is illustrating for us the heart of the Father. It's a beautiful story. But I want to go one step further here. Abraham, I think, was torn between obedience to God's command and his only son. I think that that's the issue we're facing today. The commandments of God and the death of Jesus Christ. It's a heart-wrenching saga of love and faith and hope. And it's, I think, succinctly explained in this statement, again from E.G. White, Early Writings 127. Said the angel, Think ye that the Father yielded up his dearly beloved Son without a struggle? No, no. It was even a struggle with the God of heaven whether to let guilty man perish or to give his darling son to die for them. That's what the story of Abraham illustrates for us. It was a struggle 
It wasn't easy. It isn't easy to forgive. A sacrifice has to be made. A loss has to be sustained by those that are forgiving because forgiveness infers the imperfection of the object upon which it is bestowed. Someone has hurt you. Someone has wronged you. Something has, someone has done something bad to you. And to forgive that is to respond to them as though they didn't do it. To let it go. And that requires a sacrifice. For God, it required the sacrifice of himself in the person of his son. The greatest sacrifice that could be given. Was it easy? Is it easy? Said the angel, think ye the father yielded up his only begotten son without a struggle? No, no. It was a struggle. Angels are so interested, continuing the statement, for man's salvation, that there could be found among them those who would yield their glory and give their life for perishing man. But, said my accompanying angel, that would avail nothing. The transgression was so great that an angel's life could not pay the debt. Nothing but the death and intercession of God's Son would pay the debt and save lost man from hopeless sorrow and misery. I saw that it was impossible for God to change his law in order to save lost, perishing man. Therefore, he suffered his darling son to die for man's transgressions. The issue in the controversy centers around the law of God. And we want to say, well, since Jesus died, the law has been done away with. Impossible. Impossible. That's the point. Forgiveness does not do away with the law of God. Forgiveness upholds the law of God. It protects the law of God. He makes the ultimate sacrifice. And that's what Abraham did. Think about it. Abraham could have broke God's law. He could have broken God's command. God's command was go and sacrifice. And he says, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to break that commandment. But he didn't. He obeyed God, kept the law, by making the sacrifice. They go together. Now you're going to have to wrap your mind around that and understand it, study it and understand it, but it's vitally important, especially in the day and age in which we live. The sacrifice was made to uphold the law. Now never has this story meant so much to me as it does now. Never, never has the father's struggle come home to my heart as it does in Abraham's story. As a father of two, a girl and a boy, who are still my kids, even though my daughter is now officially no longer a minor. She's an adult. She's 18. And she's let us know that ever since she was 16. <laughs> I'm going to be 18 soon. I'm going to be 18 soon. I can hardly imagine what Abraham endured as a parent as someone who has children, and as those of you who have children, and grandchildren, and people who you consider children, you always wonder and struggle with the idea of something bad happening to them. Don't you? Thinking, ah, oh, oh, ooh, agony. But for something bad to happen to them at your own hand, that, that you are giving them up to that, I can't even fathom that. I can't even fathom it. It's beyond understanding. And this is the experience that Abraham exhibits to a small degree of the heart of God. But I guess that's the point, really. In all the Bible, only Abraham and Isaac were really positioned, I think, to offer this poignant insight into heaven's heart. Listen to this commentary by Adam Clark. It was written in 1831. He says, quote, Abraham desired earnestly to be led into the mystery of redemption and God to instruct him in the infinite extent of divine goodness to mankind who spared not his own son but delivered him up for us all. Let Abraham feel the experience of what it was to lose a beloved son. A son born miraculously when Sarah was past childbearing as Jesus was miraculously born of a virgin. Abraham wanted to know. He wanted to see God's day. He wanted, he wanted to know. And so God let him in. And he did it in such a way. He didn't do it like this and said, Abraham, I want you to go sacrifice your son. And he didn't give him any hint that this was 
not going to happen. He made it a bold, strong command. Do it. So that Abraham can feel all the reality. The only hope Abraham had was he's going to resurrect in the third day. He's going to resurrect on the third day. But in Abraham's mind, this was something that was going to happen. In fact, the Bible makes it clear that this is something that Abraham actually did. It doesn't say that Abraham was going to offer his son. It says Abraham did offer his son because, because his purpose and intent was to do it, it was done. In Abraham's mind, he did it, and therefore he felt the full anguish of what it meant to do that. And therefore he entered into the heart of God and illustrated the heart of God to us. Abraham, the most dignified, the most, I'm continuing the quote now, the most immaculate of all the patriarchs, Isaac, the true pattern of piety to God and filial obedience, may well represent God the Father, so loving the world as to give his only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, to die for the sin of man. But the grand circumstances necessary to prefigure these important points could not be exhibited through the means of any or all of the whole brute creation. The whole sacrificial system of the Mosaic economy had a retrospective and prospective view referring from the sacrifice of Isaac to the sacrifice of Christ. In the first dawning of the Son of Righteousness was seen. In the latter, his married in splendor and glory. So this whole sacrificial system was all pointing to the sacrifice. But there was, this is what he's saying, but there was nothing in the whole of Scripture like Abraham and Isaac's story to, to illustrate the sacrifice. Why? Well, because in the sacrificial system, you're sacrificing a lamb. You're sacrificing a turtle dove. You're sacrificing a ram. You're sacrificing animals. There's only one place in the entire Bible where we see a father sacrificing his son. And it is not even close to an issue of child sacrifice or pagan sacrifice. It has nothing to do with that. That's not, of course, it does inform us against such a thing. Clearly, God arresting his hand at the last minute says, that is not the way sin is taken care of. Your children do not pay the debt. But that's not what Abraham needed to be cleansed of. It wasn't like Abraham was thinking that at all. <laughs> you understand. That's just an, an extension of the story. The story is really about the heart of God. The story is really about showing us how difficult, how challenging, how heart-wrenching it must have been for God to give His only begotten Son. Abraham, Jesus says, saw my day and he was glad he was glad he saw that ram in the thicket he was glad to see his day he was glad taken in this light and this light only the statement continues to say taken in this light and this is the only light in which it should be viewed Abraham offering his son Isaac is one of the most important facts and most instructive histories in the whole Old Testament. Beautiful, beautiful story. Powerful story. Wonderful story. This, then, is the faith of Abraham, gifted to us in Christ. It is now our privilege to believe from an inspired basis just why Abraham is called a friend of God. God calls us to be his friends. And the issue involved in that is to make the sacrifice. And the sacrifice that we're being called to make today is the sacrifice of forgiveness. The same sacrifice God made. Forgiveness. And it's hard. There are things that we, darling little things about ourselves and our character and how we've been wronged or whatever it is that we're going to have to sacrifice. We're going to have to give up. Lay it on the altar. But the ultimate goal and the final frontier for all of us is forgiveness. And God can do that. He can do that miracle of forgiveness in our hearts. He really can. This is the essence of the three angels' messages. Justification by faith. Forgiveness by faith. It's what prepares us finally so that when we are disappointed by the donkey and the elephant. We will turn to the Lamb and ultimately recognize in Him our destiny, our hope, our blessed hope, and our future. 
Amen? Amen? Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you so much this morning for the story of Abraham and Isaac. Thank you for ministering to our hearts by opening up your own heart to us, helping us to recognize and understand more fully perhaps than we have before the difficulty and the challenge that you yourself faced in this story, the steps sequestered by darkness that you trod when you separated yourself from your, father, your son. The ultimate sacrifice that you made so that we could be forgiven and your law could be upheld before all the universe. But most of all, Father, we want to thank you that we know through this story that you love us, that you have not withheld your only son from us, and that you have redeemed us through Jesus Christ. Forgiven, cleansed, and standing now before this world as your ambassadors. Empower us to forgive. Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.